in Unit 1, Section 3, we're talking about chemical formulas and where they come from. Now, all the way back in the 1700s, we have this French chemist named Joseph Proust who found that different samples of a chemical compound are always going to have the same composition of elements. And he was able to, to figure this out by analyzing different samples of of the same compound. He uh, called this the law of constant composition, sometimes called the law of definite proportions. And we find that this is true today. We find that, for example, if you have a sample of water, it doesn't matter where that water comes from, it's always going to be about 11% hydrogen and about 89% oxygen. Doesn't matter where that water comes from. Now, at the same time, if we take other compounds like sodium chloride, doesn't matter where the sodium chloride comes from, as long as it's a pure sample, it's going to be about 39% sodium and about 61% chlorine. So this is the constant composition that we see for these chemical compounds. Now, John Dalton, a British chemist uh, in the early 1800s, basically was able to take some ideas that other previous scientists had, had thought about and had come up with, including Proust, and some others like, uh, like Antoine Lavoisier, and explain the way that chemicals behaved by the existence of atoms. And so he came up with this atomic theory to explain uh, why chemicals and, and, and substances behave the way they do. This had four statements. The first statement of his atomic theory was that all elements are composed of atoms. At the time, it was a very uh, revolutionary thought to say that uh, that there were atoms. This was not something that people really uh, thought of too much. Uh, a second part was that atoms cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. And we know that that certainly is true today. The third part was that atoms of one element are different from atoms of other elements, and that all atoms of an element are identical to each other. Now, if you watch the last video in uh, unit 1, section 2, we know that the second part of that is wrong. We know that there are these things called isotopes. You can have different varieties of an element, like we saw the three isotopes of hydrogen. They're not identical. So that part of his atomic theory was wrong. But the first part of it is certainly correct. Atoms of hydrogen are going to be completely different from atoms of oxygen on the other hand. The fourth part was that all compounds have a fixed ratio of atoms of elements. And that sounds a whole lot like the law of constant composition that we just saw from Joseph Proust. Now, when we take a compound, we have learned already how to calculate the mass percent. So just as a very quick example, in the case of caffeine, there's its formula. We just take each number, each uh, number of atoms there, multiply it by its atomic mass. You know, we have 12 for carbon and about 1 for hydrogen and about 14 for nitrogen and 16 for oxygen. And then we add those values together and we see that the overall molecular mass of caffeine is about 194.0 AMU. And to find the percent mass for each of those individual elements, we just take the individual uh, products for each element and divide by the total. So carbon is you know, 96 divided by 194, which is about 49.5%. And hydrogen is 10 divided by the total, about 5.2%. And nitrogen, in the same way. Oxygen is the same way. So this is the percent mass. Now, is it possible for us to go in the other direction? Is it possible for us to take these percents and work backwards and get back to a formula? Well, I think it is. Now let's see how we do that. Let's take those percents that we just calculated and we're gonna go backwards. We're going to determine the empirical formula of caffeine. Now the way that we do this is we take those four or however many percent values we have given to us and we write them down and notice this is percent by mass. And so since it's percent by mass, I can call those percents gram values. So it's like if we had a sample of 100 grams of caffeine, 
49.5 grams would be carbon and 5.2 grams would be hydrogen and so forth. Now, just like in any of these conversion problems, a good first step is always to convert to moles, isn't it? That was one thing we saw way back in, uh, in section one of unit one. So we're gonna take all these gram values and convert them to moles using their individual atomic masses. And so we just, just do that. We have the mole values, so 4.125 moles and so forth. Now, we're, once we have moles, we're going to divide each of those by the smallest of those mole values. So as I look at those, those four uh, mole values down here, I see that the smallest one is 1.031. So I'm going to divide all of those by the 1.031. Now, when I do that, I get a number of four we're very close to four for carbon. I get very, very close to five for hydrogen. I get very close to two for nitrogen, and I will, of course, get one for oxygen. These, the four, the five, the two, and the one, represent the subscripts. So we have C4, H5, N2O. So that's the empirical formula of caffeine. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a second. We saw the formula for caffeine on the last slide, and this was not it. So what's the deal here? We, we, we actually don't have the real formula. This is what's called the empirical formula. And the empirical formula is a formula for a compound that represents the lowest common ratio for atoms of each element. It's kind of like a formula that's been reduced down to lowest terms. It's like, for example, if we have glucose that has the actual or the molecular formula C6H12O6, if you reduce that down to lowest terms, its, mole its empirical formula becomes CH2O because you can divide each of those subscripts by a factor of six. So CH2O is the empirical formula. Or this here, we have this compound called hydrazine. It's N2H4. That's the actual or the molecular formula for that compound. And we can divide both of those subscripts by two and make the empirical formula NH2. Now, sometimes the molecular formula is the same as the empirical formula because water actually is H2O, but you can't reduce that down anymore, so its empirical formula is also H2O. In the case of tetraphosphorus decoxide, P4O10, we can reduce that down to an empirical formula of P2O5, can't we? So we have a molecular formula and we have an empirical formula, which is in the lowest terms. So is there a way to go from empirical formula to molecular formula in the case of our little caffeine problem here? Well, yes, there is. And that little nugget of information that we need in order to make that last conversion is the molecular mass of the substance. So here's the empirical formula of caffeine that we just calculated. And it says that the molecular mass of the caffeine is 194.0. With that, now we can go to the molecular formula. And the way that we do that is we take the empirical formula that we just calculated and we add up the atomic masses of all these and we find the molecular mass of this object here. So four carbons, that's 12 apiece, 48. We have five hydrogens at about one apiece, that's five. Two nitrogens at 14 apiece, that's 28 and one oxygen, which is 16, that adds up to 97. Now, the molecular mass is 194. So we divide the molecular mass by the empirical mass that we just got. And we find that the ratio there is 2. So what that means is we have to multiply the empirical formula by 2. And when we do that, multiply all those subscripts by 2, we get the C8, H10, and 4, O2. That's the exact same molecular formula that we had way back at the beginning of this problem.
So that's how you can go from the percent by mass data backwards to the empirical formula and even the molecular formula. So that's actually a very neat little calculation to do. Let's try one more example here. We're going to take a compound this time with nitrogen and oxygen, and it has 25.93% nitrogen and 74.07% oxygen. Let's find the empirical formula. So once again, we have those two gram values. And first thing that you want to do is convert the gram values to moles. So we're going to divide nitrogen by about 14 grams in a mole and oxygen by about 16 grams in a mole. And when we do this, we get about 1.852 moles of nitrogen and about 4.629 moles of oxygen. Now, what's the next step? We have to take both of these mole values and divide by the smallest or the smaller of those two in this case. So that's 1.852. So of course this first number is going to be a 1 and when I key this into my calculator I get 2.50. So it looks like my subscripts are 1 and 2.5 and, and we all know that you can't have half of an atom, can you? You can't have a formula of N O two and a half. It doesn't work that way. So what we do is we're going to have to multiply both of these values by that denominator right there. So in this case, that denominator is a 2. So when I multiply by both, uh, both numbers by that value, I get subscripts that are actual whole numbers now, 2 and 5. So my uh, empirical formula is N2. This happens sometimes where you'll divide these numbers out and you'll have a number that's like 1 and the other one is, let's say it's 2.33. In that case, that's 2 and a third and you'd have to multiply both of these by 3 as your denominator. So keep an eye out for that because sometimes you'll divide these out and have a, a fractional value and you'll have to get uh, whole number ratios. Don't forget in a formula, any formula, you have to have whole numbers only. Hope you learned something about formulas and where we get them. My name is Jeremy Krug. I hope you enjoyed this video for Unit 1, Lesson 3. Hope you give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thanks for watching.